Welcome everyone. This is Doug with the Awakened by Yahuwah group. Today we have Sister Shushana and Sister Laura with me and we are going to be continuing in our studies in the Book of Enoch. You can find our Enoch recordings on YouTube on my channel, which is Doug Von Insegna, or actually Douglas Von Insegna and I will be putting my links on these videos for now on so people can find the channel easier for right now. But I also will be leaving the link for the group YouTube page to see all of our stuff. So I will be starting in Enoch and I will be reading the R.H. Charles version of Enoch and um, Sister Shushana. She will be reading from a similar version, or I think the same exact version. Um, and I believe Sister Laura has the Hall either the Hallelujah Scriptures one, or I forget. So, all right, chapter 18, here we go, in the Book of Enoch. I saw the treasuries of all the winds. I saw how he had furnished them with the whole creation and the firm foundations of the earth. And I saw the cornerstone of the earth. I saw the four winds which bear the earth and the firmament of the heaven. And I saw how the winds stretch out the vaults of heaven and have their station between heaven and earth. These are the pillars of heaven. I saw the winds of heaven which turn and bring the circumference of the sun and all the stars to their setting. I saw the winds on the earth carrying the clouds. I saw the paths of the Malachim, or better known as angels, or hosts of heaven. I saw at the end of the earth the firmament of the heaven above. And I proceeded and I saw a place which burns night, day and night, where there are seven mountains of magnificent stones three towards the east and three towards the south and as for those towards the east one was of colored stone of one of pearl and one of jacinth and those towards the south of red stone but the middle one reached to heaven like the throne of yahuwah of alabaster and the summit of the throne was of sapphire and i saw a Flaming fire. Beyond these mountains is a region, the end of the great earth. There the heavens were completed. And I saw a deep abyss or bottomless pit, known in the King James, with columns of heavenly fire. And among them I saw columns of fire fall, which were beyond measure alike towards the height and towards the depth. And beyond that abyss, I saw a place which had no firmament of the heaven above and no firmly founded earth beneath it. There was no water upon it and no birds, but it was a waste and a horrible place. I saw there seven stars like great burning mountains. And to me, when I inquired regarding them, the Malachim said, this place is the end of heaven and earth. This has become a prison for the stars in the host of heaven. And the stars which roll over the fire are they which have transgressed the commandment of Yahuwah in the beginning of their rising. Because they did not come forth at their appointed times. And he was angry with them and bound them till the time when their guilt should be consummated, even for 10,000 years. Wow. So that's very interesting. So technically, how many thousand years has it been since the days of Enoch? Because we, I know it's been about 6,000 since creation. So how many has it been since this event, I wonder? That's just a question I'm putting up to everyone. Um, Probably close to 5,000 years. Mm, wow. 
So, so maybe, so probably by the time of the end will be, yeah, that's pretty interesting. It says 10,000 years. Huh. Yeah. Hmm. Yes, that includes the kingdom, the millennial yeah. reign. Um, plus another 4,000 years. Mm. Mm. Plus you gotta counter in, the millennial reign is definitely nowhere near right now. And as time goes on, it probably, it probably is added to this time that they're given of 10,000 years, so. Um, so. Well, I think the millennial reign is very close. I think we're very close to that time. Hmm. Yeah, because with the millennium, you got, there's a lot of things that have to happen before the millennium. You would have to have the tribulation happen, and you would have to pretty much, um, you would have to um, have the anti-Messiah reveal himself, the image of the beast, and even after tribulation, you would have to, you know, have that point where Satan is bound for a thousand years, and that's where the millennium, you know, starts or is occurring is where that thousand years start and so yeah i i would say we're close to the millennium but it's not exactly right around the corner i think the tribulation period is about three and a half years and so and as far as i know i can tell i could be wrong but i don't see the millennium happening at the same time as tribulation i think the millennium is actually right after that and it's 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 pretty much right after the tribulation period. Um, I could be wrong, but that, that's as far as I've seen in scripture where there, there's definitely a, a chronologically, it, it would, the tribulation period has to be first because you have to have Yashrael being prepared in the wilderness, you know, given a times to be nourished during the tribulation period. And then after that, I would think who it brings us into the land for the millennium. I don't know, that's just how I see it. So, well, we've got um, just a few more years, I think, and it could be this year, according to some people, not 2017, but uh, 2018. Mm. And the um, Beast and false prophet are revealed, and I mean things could happen very quickly. Um, I'm not saying they will. Yeah. They could. Yeah, it's it's it could go either way at this point. It could be extremely escalated, or or Yahua could uh, could you know like beforehand has given us more time. A lot of times, yeah. you who know, could have had this happen in, in the mid 2000s, to be honest, or late late 2000s, like 2008, 2009. But he's he's delayed it for a reason, and so you uh, it could happen. There's so many different scenarios where it could either go really quick or it could be delayed, which I'm kind of hoping for the latter, that it is delayed because that that will give people more time. Because I'll be honest, if the uh, if the tribulation happened today, a lot of people wouldn't be prepared. A lot of people would would be worried about the cares of the world and tossed to and fro. And it, and I think you know, in my opinion, I think Yahuwah wants more people to come into what is known as the fullness of the nation. 
That's, that's just my opinion. I think he wants more people to get right with him before the tribulation happens. And I think it's I think it's possible. Now, do I know for a fact it's going to get delayed again? I have no idea, but I'm hoping. That's my hope is that he delays it again. I think, you know, just my opinion, I think that's why the other person didn't become president. Because if that would have happened, we would have had chaos and pretty much World War III probably would have started if she was in office right now. So I think Yehud... Yes, you promised it. <laughs> Yehud did something. He, he allowed that guy to win for a reason. He, he Obviously, he's holding back on the tribulation on the day of Yehud that follows, you know, you know, and, um, yeah, I, that's just my view. I think it could go either way at this point. I can't say either way whether it's going to be really quick like this year or whether it's going to be, you know, five, ten years down the road. I don't know. It's, well, no, none of us can tell. <laughs> we don't know it's not this time. Yeah. And, um, uh, we just have to wait and see what happens. But, okay, so we have a question. When it says in verse 16, mm -hmm. the 10,000 years, is that unleashing the abyss of the Nephilim no. back? It's talking about the, the watchers are chained um, in the bottomless pit. The abyss or Greek word of abuso is translated in our in our new testaments a lot of times as the bottomless pit you'll find it in revelations 9 11 where it says they had a cane over them the, the malachim of the abyss or bottomless pit a bottom and so this this is pretty much the same place the bottomless pit is where these outer body nephilim spirits are and where their parents are the watchers who pretty much never died at that point they've been chained they they can't die technically you know you made you know angels pretty much not angels i don't want to say this, angels, but made malachim like him and we were originally made immortal until sin entered and that's what changed us that's that's what made us mortal is sin tampered with our dna sin broke that chain and I forget what it's called, but uh, some right. call it double ladder case, and I forget the term that Ken Hogan uses for it, but it's like a scientific term. So I, I get that part, but what I'm saying is, so when it talks about in Revelation, when the abyss will be opened up, and the Nephilim, as it was in the day of Noah, so shall be at the day of the end, and the Nephilim return. Mm -hmm. After the 10,000 years? Because like she said... Uh, she believes yeah. we're making like six thousand years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I believe that the abyss will be opened. <clears throat> I think the abyss will be opened though. Uh, in the fifth seal, I I kind of see that happening with. I don't know if is Revelations nine the fifth seal. I, I thought it was, where it talks about that. The um, a call the, the there was smoke that came out of the pit and talks about the um the sun not giving its light and all of that that uh, Joel talks about and I wonder if that's the fifth seal I'm not too sure I don't want to I don't want to lead people astray in this the, the fifth seal is the beginning of the killing of the saints mm. that's what right. signifies the fifth seal. And right. um, I think what I'm going to do here is I'm going to try to figure out what seal, because I would like to check real quick. I know some translations actually tell you which seal Revelations 9 is. So I just want to see here. Revelations 9, which says, let's see, do they give us a title here? No. Let's try the ISV. Sometimes other translations will. Oh, okay. So this is the fifth trump. Right back there. Huh, that's pretty interesting notes by the ISV. They believe that, uh, so they actually believe Wormwood is Lucifer. Huh, that's interesting. 
So in their little notes of the International Standard Version, they says, and the fifth angel blew his trumpet, up and, and I saw a star that had fallen to the earth, i.e. Lucifer, from the sky, or from heaven. The star was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit, the realm of the punishment of the afterlife. Oh, wow, so they give some good notes here. It opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and smoke came out of it, the shaft like the smoke. So I guess seals are different from trumpets. Like, I'm not too good with that, that um, what is it called, etymology, where you understand the difference between the seals and the trumpets. I kind of forget because it, I know about the trumpets and each angel, I mean, each Malachim has a different trumpet when something happens. They blow, each, each Malachim blows their trumpet when something success is the next event so according to this translation is saying that revelation 9 is the fifth trumpet i don't know if necessarily i doubt the fifth trumpet literally means the fifth seal it's probably a different category i think trumpets and seals are different yeah yeah right that's that's what i thought yeah so so I don't know what seal Revelations 9 is. I would have to do some really good. I wonder if it tells you in the chapter. I wonder if it actually says. Uh, this is the same chapter where it talks about do not harm the um, grass of the earth, nor the ones that have the seal of Yahuwah on their foreheads. So this is like the same chapter, which which um, I don't know etymologically when that's supposed to happen, or actually the correct term is eschatologically, study of end times, where that would happen with Revelation 9, if it happens before the tribulation or during the wrath, the bulls, because there's also part of Revelations that talks about the bulls of wrath, and each Malachim dumps the bulls of Yahuwah's wrath on mankind, so... That's where I'm a little confused, and I'll be honest, I don't know exactly yeah. the chronological. The the There's uh, quite a quite a bit of um, stuff going on during uh, the tribulation, and then during the wrath of Yahuwah. Um, you have the um, seven seals, and you have the seven trumpets. And then you have the three woes, and um, the Malachim dump the bowls of woe <laughs> on the population, and um, we're we're not we're not anywhere near there. Um, we're still in the riding of the four horsemen which have been writing for many years, um, perhaps millennia. Uh, we've had the uh, false teachings and we've had um, wars and we've had sickness, disease, famines, and death. I mean, for many, 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 years um but uh the fifth seal is actually the killing of the saints and we've actually had that a couple of times before too the um mm -hmm. catholic church in their crusades was one time and then hitler again he he killed many jewish people and uh christian people who were not catholic and he even killed some catholics so um even the fifth seal has been open a couple of times uh this would just be the end time fulfillment of all of that which yes. is coming I just found it on here. I want to show our audience that will be on YouTube what we're talking about here. So this is this is the chapter of the fifth seals, Revelation six, which literally talks about the seals in the introduction. And I and I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as if it were the noise of thunder, 
and one of the four beasts or animals saying, come and see. And I saw and behold a white horse and he who sat on it had a bow and the crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. So basically the seals are talking about, um, they're, they're the four horsemen, basically. The four horsemen event where you have each horseman and what happens after each horseman, that's the seal. So that's actually separate technically from what Revelations 9 is talking about with the trumpet. So yeah, the, that's where it gets confusing with most people because we're taught. I know in the church, they definitely didn't make a separation between the five seals and the five trumpets. There was like no separation. So it was like very confusing. So, and that's an interesting study to do really is what are the five trumpets? Now, according to... According to Revelations 9, the fifth trumpet is where the bottomless pit opened. That's, that's the fifth. So I don't even know what trumpet we're really at at this point. I don't even know. Are we somewhere along the line into the trumpets? I don't. We haven't had the first trumpet yet. Um, because let me, let me find it and I'll read it to you what it is. Um, Because I, I know that when the first trumpet happens, it's uh, it's when a lot of destruction happens. And remember in Revelation 7, uh, Yahuwah tells the four messengers standing at the four corners of the earth not to allow any of the uh, winds to blow on the earth to harm any of the trees or the grass until he seals his people and his people are the number of, of 144,000 that were sealed. And um, then Revelation 9 tells us that when the bottomless pit is opened and these locusts come out, they are to harm only the men and women who do not have the seal of, of Yahuwah. So um, here's the, the first trumpet. Uh, the first messenger sounds. This is Revelation 8, verse 7. The first messenger sounded, there came to be hail and fire mixed with blood, and they were thrown into the earth. And a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. So that's the first one, and we haven't seen that. And then the second messenger sounds, and a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and the third of the sea became blood and a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Now, there's some people who are saying that, well, a third of the creatures in the sea are dead because of Fukushima. But that's only one sea that is in the Pacific. Um, but no, we haven't even seen the first trumpet. Yeah, I don't, I don't believe that that's happened yet. Any of the trumpets, as far as I know, I haven't seen anything indicate that we're in the trumpets. I think we're, we're definitely, we've been in the seals and we've been in the seals for a long time. Mm -hmm. I, I agree, we're, we're somewhere around the fifth seal. And we're getting close to the final fulfillment of the fifth seal. <laughs> and the fifth seal basically says that the name of the writer is death the grave and sheol follows it you know so it's it's pretty much the it's like the grave in the bottomless pit is representing this writer and whatever that Four means believers. <laughs> uh yeah believers are, are the ones targeted 
when the fifth seal is open. Um, I'll see if I can find that one. I got it right here, actually. Um, the the verse about the uh, green horse. Let's see here. Let me go to share screen and I'll discover it again. And it says. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. Now the word pale, according to the Greek lexicon, should actually be green. And his name that sat on him was death. So death, the grave, and hell, or in the Hebrew, Sheol, followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death. And with the beasts of the earth. So pretty much it's an escalation of death. The escalation to kill a certain, many people believe a certain population, the earth. Um, some people believe that it's one fourth. I mean, that's that's kind of a guess. I don't know exactly how many, but it says the fourth part of the earth. What you know, whatever that exactly means. It, we know for a fact it's a certain amount of people on the earth are going to be killed with a sword. So we don't we don't know exactly what the fourth part of the earth means. Um, but that I, is the um, still the second seal because war is the second seal. Hmm. I thought the five horses were the five seals. I always, I always you know, understood. Um, guillotines they bought in this country. All those guillotines are going to be used to cut our heads off. Mm. If for those who don't worship the beast and his image, and I believe that's part of the reason why we're we're being we're going to get taken out or we're being called out into the wilderness to save us from that. Oh uh, yeah. Because scripture revelation says that some of you will be killed. It doesn't say all. Oh, right. Some of you will be put in jail. Some of you will be beheaded for my witness. So it's not like every believer is going to be beheaded. So yeah. uh, if you look at Luke 21, verse 36, it tells you to watch and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all this that's coming upon the earth and to stand before the son of man bin ha adam which is our messiah yahusha and um then revelation 12 gives the whole scenario which by the way we have seen this year the great signs in the heavens that are depicted in revelation 12 the um, woman clad with the sun with the moon under her feet and on her head the crown of 12 stars and then just more recently even than that is the uh, second sign sign this the great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head and his tail draws the third of the stars of the heavens and throws them down to the earth and and there was actually a meteor shower which could have depicted that um, and then it's not too far after that that the woman flees to the wilderness and there's been two fleeings or there will be two fleeing the first time was when um, Antiochus Epiphanes destroyed um, the temple and uh, the true believers fled um, and then the ultimate fulfillment has yet to happen and we uh, read in um, I think it's Matthew 24 where it says, let the reader understand about the abomination of desolation. So it may not be what it was before. 
it may be something a little different. It just says, let the reader understand. But at the abomination of desolation is when the woman flees. And then the whole scenario is right after Satan's thrown down to the earth, he persecutes the woman. And Revelation 12 verses 14 through 17 tells you exactly what happens to the woman and where she ends up. And it also says that in verse 17, the dragon is enraged with the woman and he goes to fight with the remnant of her seed, those guarding the commands of Yahuwah and possessing the witness of Yahusha HaMashiach. And we also are keeping the commandments and have the witness of Messiah. So there's um, only a couple of things that separate us from the group that he kills. And I believe that's the watching and praying in Luke 21, 36. Because that's what it tells us to do. Watch always and pray that you might be counted worthy to escape. We have to be counted worthy by Yahweh to be taken to the wilderness. Okay, so who's going to read? I want to see what happens next. <laughs> okay. Um, anyone who wants to, this is a, wow, this is a short chapter. I'll take it. Okay. And Uriel said to me, here shall stand the angels who have con connected themselves with women and their spirits assuming many different forms are defiling mankind and shall lead them astray into sacrificing to demons as gods. Here shall they stand all till the day of the great judgment in which they shall be judged till they are made an end of. And the women also of the angels who went astray shall become sirens. And I, Enoch, alone saw the vision, the ends of all things, and no man shall see as I have seen. So to me, that clearly states that these women willfully did stuff with these Malachim. This is not... And this is where the debate goes with many people. Oh, it says the sons of Elohim, they took women and they, they raped them. Well, Enoch wouldn't be telling you that they're getting punished if they were raped. And that, that's clear that they were willfully doing with the Watchers and they were consenting. It wasn't the Watchers like forcing them and because obviously if it's saying that it says the women also of the Malachim who went astray shall become sirens. So meaning that they went astray. They did stuff with them that, you know, that's just truly really what I believe. I don't believe it's, uh, I don't believe they were raped. That's just me. I don't. That's very interesting, Doug, because uh, I wrote a song about it in which I said that the Nephilim, or not the Nephilim, but the um, fallen messengers came down and raped our women. Well, I'm going to have to change that word because I think you're right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, think about it. Why would you punish someone that, that didn't have a choice in it? I mean, that doesn't even make sense. Who doesn't punish people when they no, have No, he doesn't. Matter. I mean, that's his character. I have a different theory. What's the other theory? Okay, let's say that they did that with the women. But you have to remember, they were impregnated. These women were impregnated and they bore their children. Now there is children that are 
unsavable in his eyes. And you have to understand when a woman gives birth to a child, it's part of them. And so, and then these fallen angels taught these women that they ravished the secrets of heaven and, you know, parting of the rooting and these different cells and these different things that they were doing. That was a part of the abomination. So it's one thing to be ravished. Yes. Okay. And Yahuwah would have set them apart for that. But even after that, because they were impregnated and had a child, they still went and were still willing to learn the things from these fallen angels and went along in that lifestyle and raising up That's their children as well. If they just got ravished and then t still turned away, I think Yahuwah would have granted them. You, you follow me? But I think that part of their sin was good because they did have a child that was... Um, yeah, and they punished the uh, children, so that was like separate. They, the children, as you read, or we read earlier in Enoch, Yahuwah actually punishes their children before he punishes the mothers. He right, actually, there was a redemption for the children because it, it was an abomination because mm -hmm. of the, the mix, DNA or whatever you want. Um, oh, yeah. No, so, I agree that there's more to the punishment, but in context, what the verse is actually saying, it's, it's making it a distinct what, what, what distinctly they did to cause this punishment like for every punishment Yahuwah gives us there's always an action for each punishment like he he's a right righteous judge he's not gonna and that's all i was trying to say that if they were ring it wouldn't be righteous for him to do that that but that, I, that would, that Laura would, be, saying, that would um, be what he says in scripture he says i'm a righteous judge be a righteous judge don't judge according to partiality and according to persons. He's not a respecter of persons, so he's not gonna he's not gonna basically condemn someone when someone didn't do anything wrong. That's all I was trying to say. And many people believe that they were I right. A hundred percent. I agree. That's that's why I disagree with that interpretation of Genesis six four. Because if you believe that, then Yahuwah is going out of his character. He's going outside of what he tells you to not change. Meaning his oh. character does not does not change. So if I do something wrong, I deserve punishment. Now if I but sin they get wrong. and he punishes me, that's unrighteous. That that's all I'm trying to say. It's the the that's just what I believe that for first like I don't believe you who punishes women that get raped. I know a lot of unbelievers disagree, but whatever. He doesn't punish people that no. get raped or anything. And if anything, not punish them for that. So she has a gift from him. And some people don't look at it that way, but that baby is like a gift. It's a blessing. And he could have easily let that baby die in childbirth and then the woman's been raped and a, her child died at the same time. But he blesses her with that child, something good came out of something that was meant for evil, and that's actually in the Bible. Because it talks about the everything that really God for evil. Is a, Nephilim, is a Nephilim a blessing? Well, I don't yeah, think so. <laughs> no, no, I was, I was more of talking about, like, nowadays when people say, you know, they get raped and, you know, and that, you know, they don't want to keep the child from that event. And they think it's a curse. I, I was trying to say that's a blessing. When you get a normal... Child. Uh, a completely, totally, 100% human child is a baraka, or blessing, yeah. as you say. But and the Nephilim, which is what occurred between the fallen angels and the women, were far from yeah. a blessing. I, I think many of the women probably died because they could not give birth to these huge things mm -hmm. that inside them. Um, but what Laura was saying, I understand what she meant by, <laughs> let's say, let's say a woman is raped by, by these fallen angels. She's not held responsible for that. She's not 
punished for that. But let's say she uh, does get in, intrigued with their teachings after the fact, and she learns these magic spells and whatever they teach, that is punishable. And she may not be punished for being raped, but she's certainly punished for the um, magic spells and potions and uh, whatnot they're, they're teaching her. Um, that's, that's what I think Laura was trying to say. Yeah, I agree 100%. They, they still, and they still could have repented from, um, you know, doing these weird sorceries and cutting roots and, and worshiping demons, as it says earlier in the chapter. They could have repented of that, and that's why Noah was preaching repentance for a couple hundred years. I, I don't believe he was mm -hmm. preaching repentance to their children or whatever was left of their children. He was preaching repentance to the human men and women um, for doing whatever they yeah. did. So they... Um, I don't believe that a creature such as a Nephilim, which was created by sin of the fallen angels, I don't believe they could repent. No. I think that that they were given evil spirits because Yahweh did not give them the spirits. He gives us a spirit when he creates us. Mm -hmm. Their fathers gave them their spirits and their fathers were in sin. Yeah. So, no, they cannot, they could not repent. Therefore, Noah's preaching of righteousness had to have been to people who were 100% human, is my yeah. belief. And that's what you were saying. Yeah, the, um, the, and it's, it's interesting because you really don't see the women being talked about much after this. It's from the first 15 to 20 chapters. It's mostly the men, the, the Malachim, the watchers being punished. And that one verse is like really the only verse they're mentioned. And it, it seems like there's, there's no sign of them repenting. So it seems like it's all willful. Whatever they're doing is all willful. All they weren't forced to do anything. They 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 pretty much did everything on their own accord and they're they're not repenting for some reason. And whether whether it is they've been deceived into, you know, worship probably the worshiping of demons has a stronghold on them. And yeah. And that obviously that's probably why they're not repenting. And it, it's interesting because it says sacrificing to demons as mighty ones. And this is where Paul says in the New Testament, the nations that sacrifice to idols do not sacrifice to mighty ones or, or Allahim, they sacrifice to demons. So, you know. It's coming again because uh, Daniel 2, 43, we were talking about that verse just last night um, where the um, let me let me find it I'll read it <clears throat> as you saw iron mixed with clay they are mixing themselves with the seed of men but they're not clinging to each other even as the iron does not mix with clay um, and also, there is a place where it talks about where they they worship they they made a big mistake in worshiping these demons as gods, and um, I've got a cross reference to. Let's see, Revelation 17. Let 
No, that's not the verse I'm looking for. Um, do you happen to know where that verse is, Doug? Where it talks about they they what they um the men were worshiping them. They took them to be gods. They took them to be mighty ones. Hmm. Not too sure. I was actually, while you were talking, I was looking up the term mingle um, in the Strongs, where it says they will mingle themselves with the seed of men. Now, mingle usually in the scriptures is a sexual term. And usually the, the only reference I can really think about where I've seen it before in this type of context is where it says, um, let me think, I'm trying to think of the exact verse where it talks about, or, um, no, 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 the word I'm thinking of is cling. They shall not cling together. And Adam and Eve uh -huh. clinged to one another. It says they became one flesh when they clung to one another. Now, if you combine mingle with the seed of men, they will not cling to each other. There's obviously something going on where they're mixing uh, a seed that's not of humankind is mixing itself again with what is human. So again, it, it, there's, there's multiple ways you can in, interpret that verse. And it's, to me, there's only two options. It's either there's a second incursion coming and Satan and his angels are going to try to have Satan and his Malachim, I should better say, are going to have their last hurrah and try to do what the Watchers did in the end times and, you know, come into women. Or it's going to be a more of a technological mingling. And I can see both. I can see transhumanism or, or uh, Malachim DNA with human DNA. I mean... It, you could take your pick on those two theories that either one fits. And well, look what they already have been doing with the um, alien abductions. Uh, they have definitely taken sperm and eggs from the women and done something with them. And many of the women claim that they were impregnated <sighs> Mm. and can remember giving birth to children that were taken from them. Wow. Oh, I, I never knew about that. I Honestly, I, I never even looked into the whole probing stuff because I always thought that was, I don't know, I always thought that was like stuff that shills would put out and people that are like fake truthers would put out as like fear tactics. I never really took it seriously years ago. I was, I was always like, hmm. So I always thought it was like, like the whole green alien idea. But when I started realizing like what aliens actually are, that they're demons, it started making a lot more sense that they're actually the spirits of the giants. And they're actually, they appear as these gray aliens. And that's what, uh, mm -hmm. what's that guy's name you drew a picture of? I always forget this guy's name. Uh, he had, uh, uh, Alistair Crowley. Yeah, Alistair Crowley. He drew a picture yeah. of an alien and said, yeah. "That's that's the entity. That's the demon that spoke to him." And he called it Lamb, which is really weird. Very, very that's strange. And he. You know, he said supposedly he, he would always claim to be the beast, 666. Like, he was wicked. This was a guy that, that just totally, totally was into that stuff. And that's why, that's what makes more sense about aliens, though. That's, that's where the whole probing thing comes in. Because they're trying to find bodies. They're, they're leeches. They're parasites. They need bodies to dwell in. They can't. They don't have their own bodies. They, when the giants were killed, their spirits, because the spirits weren't mortal, you know, roamed the earth. That's where we get ghosts from. Yes, yeah, you know. <laughs> All this. Enoch, 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 Enoch. Enoch. 
<laughs> they shall evil spirits on earth and evil spirits shall they be called. But anyway, the you don't have to read the next chapter because I was going to read when I kind of like looked ahead and I'm like, I'm not going to be able to pronounce these names. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, I can definitely help out with this. Yeah, I think I'll read chapter 20. I've, I've read this enough where I kind of I kind of know how to read the ones. I'll probably just just for a uh, just for a message for people here. We most of us, I don't know about all of us, but most of us don't acknowledge the Masoretic pronunciations. So wherever you see L, I will be pronouncing it back in the Paleo Al, like Alihi, and not not with the E. So. That's just a warning for anyone listening on this recording. I won't be honoring the Masoretic vowel points. Um, so this is chapter 20, and the title for it on my version says, Name and Functions of the Seven Archangels. Again, seven. Yeah. I heard somewhere seven is the number of completion. Supposedly, that's you who is like number. That's like, that's why he uses it a lot. Like he... That's why it's the seventh day of the week was when the earth was completed. And it's like, you can find seven, like everywhere. Jubilee, um, the Jubilee years after 49 years, which is seven times seven. I mean, you can find that like everywhere in scripture. And that's an, just for a disclaimer. I don't believe in Bible codes. I don't, I don't do that. But I, I believe you will find like, um, like basically symbology and Yahuwah uses certain numbers for reasons. Like right in scripture, you don't even have to find it. Like you'll see it like right away. But anyway, um, and these are the names of the set apart Ali, um, um, Malachim who watch. So these are the huh. So these are like a watcher. Interesting. Yuri Al, one of the set apart Malachim who is over the world and over Tartarus. Now, people who don't know what Tartarus is. Um, that's actually a Greek word that's used when referring to the bottomless pit, the abyss, the abuso. And um, I believe Peter even references Tartar Tartarus in the New Testament. I, I don't know that verse offhand, but he does talk about how the Malachim are chained over Tartarus in Second Peter. So he actually uses that same terminology as Enoch. Um, Raphael, one of the set apart Malachim who is over the spirits of men. Ragu Al, one of the set apart Malachim who take vengeance on the world of the luminaries. Oof. So this guy is like a mercenary. This guy is like Yahuwah's guide to, uh, I guess, take out the bad stars. <laughs> Mika'al, which is Michael in the English. One of the set apart Malachim to with he that is set over the best part of mankind and over chaos. Now, interestingly enough, this references me to the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 12, where it says, Michael, when he stands up, the prince over your people. And it's talking about Yahshua, talking about all 12 tribes, and because it's not referencing, you know, the southern kingdom alone, it's saying your people. He's talking about the all 12 tribes. So it's interesting how that connects with verse 5 of Enoch, chapter 20, that he set over the best part of mankind. So I kind of found that interesting. Like, you know, Yahuwah always says, we're the head, not the tail. We're like the best part of mankind. So I don't know. That's, that's what jumped out to me. Um, and over chaos. So I guess he's got to watch out for wars, and, you know, craziness. Uh, let's see, Saraka Al, one of the set apart Malachim who is set over the spirits who transgress in the spirit. Okay, that's weird. So this guy's like set over, I guess, the bottomless pit too. He's got to watch out for evil spirits, unclean spirits. And wow, that's crazy. Gabra Al, or Gabriel in the uh, English tongue. One of the set apart Malachim who is over paradise. Wait a minute. This guy's over Eden. And the serpents. Hmm. 
wonder who that's talking about, the serpents and the cherubim. <laughs> well, technically, one of them is a cherubim already. And that's referring to uh, Halel, a.k.a. Lucifer. He was a cherubim. So he's known as the serpent or the Nachash in Genesis 3. The divining, the divining one. The one that, uh, you know, and actually Nachash, the Hebrew word Nachash actually means to be a diviner, to seduce with magic. So that's actually the original phrase they used for Satan in the garden. And then it traditionally was replaced with serpent. Uh, verse 8, Remi Al, one of the set apart Malachim, whom Yahuwah said over those who rise. Huh. So it's almost like he said over the people that rise in the morning. Mm. Interesting. That rise in the sun. Tribulation. I mean, in the, <laughs> the rise in the um, resurrection, I was trying to say. Oh, yeah, that didn't even come into my head. I was just thinking, like, literally, who rise? Like, and I'm like, oh, well, we get up in the morning. I guess he's watching over us. Uh, I, I was, the resurrection didn't even come to my mind. I'm glad you brought that up. I, I totally, that went psh, right over my head. Mm -hmm. That's just the first thing that I thought of. Because what's interesting, Isaiah 14, 12 in the Septuagint, I'm going to show you guys something interesting, why that came to my mind when I read, you know, he's put over those who rise, and, you know, we rise up in the morning. And it's kind of interesting, the original translation of Isaiah 14, 12 does not say son of the morning. And I think I've showed Shushana this before, but in the Septuagint, it reads a little different than the Masoretic text here. And it says, how has Halel, or Lucifer, that rose in the morning, fallen from heaven? He that sent orders to all the nations is crushed to the earth. So the, uh, the Septuagint actually translates that verse a tiny bit differently than the KJV and all the other Bibles with the Masoretic text. They actually translate who rose up in the morning, like rising and, you know, getting up out of bed. So it was kind of interesting to me and about, you know, the difference between that and son of the morning. And it was kind of interesting to see a difference there. But yeah, and it's kind of interesting, the cherubim and serpent verse. It's kind of interesting. So Gabriel, or Gabriel, is set over Eden. Huh. I find that interesting, especially the fact when you read in the Tanakh and it says that the two cherubim guarded the Garden of Eden. And, uh, you know, and, you know, thinking that Gabriel was set over the, the Garden of Paradise, Eden. So I wonder, I wonder who the two cherubim were. I mean, obviously one of them. Huh? That's interesting. That's interesting. I, I think you're right. The paradise probably does refer to Eden. Yeah, the reason I got that was the ISR 1998 actually translates the Garden of Eden as the Garden of Elohim or the Garden of Paradise. So I actually got that from the translation. They uh, translated it, like, I forget if it's the ISR 1998 or 2009 that translates it like that, but let me see. If I go to the scriptures 1998, which I have on my Bible discovery app, and go to Ezekiel, where this is talking about the fall of Lucifer, and it's in Ezekiel 28. <coughs> and this is where I get the idea that he is a cherubim because it calls him a cherubim in this chapter. And let's see here, let me go to. Let me see, I'm going to share my screen again real quick and go to the Bible Discovery app, which this is Ezekiel 28, and I'm starting off with 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, and you shall say to him, thus says the master Yahuwah, 
you were you were sealing up a pattern complete in wisdom and perfect in loveliness. Oh boy. You were in Eden, the garden of Alahim. Every precious stone was your covering. The ruby, topaz, diamond, barrel, shilham, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald, and gold. The workmanship of your settings and mountings was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub or cherub that covers. And I placed you, and you were on the set-apart mountain of Yahuwah. You walked up and down in the middle of the stones of fire. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found. By the greatness of your trade, you became filled with violence within, and you transgressed. So I thrust you from the mountain of Yahuwah, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your loveliness. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I threw you to the earth. I laid you before kings to look at you. So that's pretty much the fall of Halo. That's pretty much describing him, what he looked like, that he was perfect in beauty and all of that. And it says the Garden of Elohim. And I think there is a translation that does say Garden of Paradise. I just can't remember which translation it is. So, um, I wonder if, if it's Scriptures 2009. I'm about to do a little test here because I have an e-sword too. We'll go to Scriptures 2009. Because <coughs> I would like to find that, especially if it correlates with what we just read. Um, Here is a garden of Elohim. So most of them say garden of Elohim, which is interesting. Um, I wonder what the KJV says actually. Curious. No, I'm curious. Well, all of them pretty much say the same thing. Okay. Could have sworn I seen the Garden of Paradise. Now I want to look that up. Now, now that's going to bother me. I swore I thought I saw that phrase in one of the translations. Garden of Paradise Bible verse. See, sometimes this I will be. Uh, I mean, Yahusha refers to paradise, but I think he's talking about the kingdom. So never mind, that's different. Uh, well, Revelations 2 7 kind of hints that this is a renewed Eden, because it says in Revelations 2 7, it says, um, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of Yahuwah. Now, we know that the tree of life, according to Genesis, was in the Garden of Eden. So, it could be just universal terminology, and we could be talking about the same place. Because... Tree of Life was in the Garden of Eden, actually, literally, and Yahuwah actually didn't allow Adam and Eve to eat it. He said, lest they eat of the Tree of Life and live forever. And um, uh, I've always had a weird theory on that. I always thought about it, well, what if they ate the Tree of Life and then they were stuck like this forever? <laughs> Maybe that's why he was like, let them not eat of that. 
Because who would want to be in a sinful body forever? Like that that's that's torture. That's Yeah. That's, well, he made sure they did. Yeah. If you think about it, that's kind of similar to Revelations where it says, um, those who took the mark of the beast, they were uh seeking death but couldn't find it. Right. And it's like what if you know Yahuwah knows <laughs> that reality and he's like, Yeah, I don't I don't want my children to have to, you know, seek death because they're in these disgusting fleshy bodies. <laughs> yeah. And that, that just made me wonder. It's interesting. Um it's in, it's interesting how we were talking earlier about this transhumanism and Satan is offering mankind today that same eternal life through a a physical body, whether it's a computer or robotic or whatever it is, it's still physical, and um, that's that's what he offers instead of true eternal life and the spirit, which is what Yahuwah offers. And no man can have the kingdom, which is the true eternal life and spirit, through another door besides Yahusha, Hamashiach. So this uh, this uh, transhumanism means of e so-called eternal life is going to be eternal hell. Yeah. <laughs> Once they realize that, oh wow, uh, I want to die now, then they're seeking death and can't find it. Yes. It's going to be torture because they're they're going to be tortured by these weird satanic hybrids and they can't die. It's like you're in so much pain that you want death, but death is fleeting. Mm -hmm. It's like that that's a horrible feeling. Yes, and um I can relate to it in the current state of my body <laughs> because I'm in chronic pain and I have diabetic neuropathy and uh it would be very bad without something to relieve it. I would want to die, probably. Oh, no, probably to it. <laughs> yeah. I have a weird theory about the original Garden of Eden because I just started looking up verses on paradise because I was looking for the term Garden of Paradise. There's that verse from 2 Corinthians that Paul says that he was caught up to paradise. He says that um, there's a man I knew that was caught up to paradise. And some translations say the third heaven, which is Yahuwah's throne. Now, what if the original Garden of Eden was a, a, a point in time where heaven and earth were basically one, and Yahuwah's throne was like literally right above the garden? And that that could be what the paradise is referring to because it seems like there's going to be another Garden of Eden after you know the Battle of Armageddon, a new heaven and a new earth. And it seems like we want to renew the face of the earth uh, for the kingdom, <coughs> and it'll be like the Garden of Eden, I believe. And I I just see a universal theme of. Yahuwah's throne or the third heaven being paradise and the same terminology is almost being used for the garden. So I just found that interesting. Like what I wonder if there's some connection there. Probably. <laughs> That's why I pay attention to words that Yahuwah uses because he he uses repetition with certain terms for a reason. He tell, you know, I, that's his spirit. Telling us, like, hey, pay attention to that word right there. You've seen it somewhere else. 
Like I, I'm just looking at this. I'm, um, you know, I'm at a Christian website, and surprisingly, they have this talking about paradise, and which some of it is off, obviously, but there's some of it that's actually pretty interesting. The word paradise is used a lot. And what's interesting is the verses we just read, they have under for verses on paradise of Ezekiel 28, 12 to 13. So even, even the Christians understand that, that the Garden of Eden can be a, gar, a garden of paradise, like they're one and the same. That's kind of interesting. And once I find the translation I'm thinking of, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cite it because that really had me thinking a while back. I was like, wow. And the stones of fire. I mean, a lot of that stuff you'll find in Enoch, what, what uh, Yahuwah was speaking through Ezekiel to uh, Halel. And a lot, of, a lot of that same elements of Yahuwah's creation and, you know, the mountain of Yahuwah. You know, which I always wondered, like, what is the mountain of Yahuwah? Is that referring to Zion? Like or or Sion, like I always wondered, like what is the is there like a heavenly mountain that he has up there? Because it it seems like it's not talking about Earth. It's like talking about some other realm that Halel was on. He was on like the mountain of Yahuwah, I think it says in that chapter in Ezekiel twenty eight. Um, kind of reminded me of Isaiah fourteen twelve, where he says, "I will." I will rise above the stars of Yahuwah and sit up at the top of the mountain or at the lofty mountain. So I wonder what is that mountain? Like, that's something I always think about. Yeah, Hillel had a lot of I wills. Yeah, the three <laughs> I wills. I forget what Christian guy said that. Lucifer's three I will. I will ascend up into heaven. I will, uh, you know, I will be like the most high. Uh, and then the third one was like, you know, I will raise up my throne above the stars. So he wanted, he wanted to rule where Yahuwah ruled and rule over the other Malachim. That was his goal. He wanted to be Yahuwah. <laughs> he wanted That's to what be. he wanted to be like the most high. And I think like is even taken a little bit away of what from what he wanted to do. I think he actually wanted to be Yahuwah. That's Yahuwah, why Second yeah. Thessalonians it says that he will claim to be him. He will say, you know, he will mm -hmm. he will um, what is it called? He he esteems himself over every other mighty one and he claims to be Yahuwah. And, mm -hmm. and that's the answer. Oh, no, I think he's going to use a different name. But basically, he's going to claim to be the creator of heaven and earth. Yeah, I think that that honestly was the purpose of the false name. It was the purpose of hijacking the Messiah's identity and making his own his own Messiah, his own um, you know, basically his own way to have humans worship him but not directly and he knows that if he just reveals himself you know as himself no one would worship him i mean you would have some satanists like some luciferians but not the whole world you wouldn't have no. you wouldn't have that reminds, reminds me of a scripture doesn't it say somewhere in revelation that at the very end of all time with at the judgment that Yahuwah will reveal who Hasatan really is and the whole world will stand there and wonder like as in to say really are you serious that was the whole cause of disorder and havoc upon all earth I mean we'll find out regardless because he gets thrown into the lake of fire in Revelations 22, so we're gonna see him like physically being thrown into the lake of fire. So we will see what he looks like, and uh, even though we haven't seen him face to face, the the wicked one, we kind of know what he looks like, only because of what Scripture gives his appearance off as 
you know, we know he's a very beautiful, you know, Malachim. He's very, he's a cherubim, so he's that class of angel. He's of Malachim. And obviously, Yahuwah made him very attractive, which, you know, is kind of strange, but it's like he, I believe he made us believe he's a, he's, you know, a red guy with a pitchfork to kind of like make people not take him seriously. And for me personally, I think he, you know, he looks like a Malachim who is probably, you know, very attractive or appealing to the eye, according to Ezekiel 28. And, you know, probably, you know, I don't know what happens when a Malachim sins or if they change in appearance, like get dark wings or, you know, they start, you know, becoming look demonic because they, they've allowed sin to corrupt them. I don't know. I think there was definitely a transformation because the chapter says that until unrighteousness was found in you. And so it's kind of like, did something change in his appearance because he sinned? And technically, <clears throat> he was the first transgressor. Because in the New Testament says he transgressed from the beginning. So meaning that he was, he, he transgressed before Adam and Eve. And he, he, he was the actual first person to, well, first being to bring sin into the world. And, and so I don't know what his appearance, his appearance probably though is, very different from what he's portrayed as. He's, you know, he's, um, and I, I would have to look up what a cherubim actually looks like because there is a description of them in the Tanakh when they're making the Ark of, Ark of Witness or the Ark of Testimony. Yahuwah has them, like, engrave these cherubim covering, you know, it's almost like covering the mercy seat and, so they have to know somewhat what a cherubim looks like to do that. So that that would be something interesting to look up what it looks like. I mean, there's been a lot of like like kids movies that Christian ministries try to do and try to like you know, they try to get, you know, what the devil would look like when before he fell. You know, but I don't know. I he might be revealed his image might be revealed to us or we might just you know, we get a quick glimpse of him being thrown into the fire. I don't know. I guess it's up to Yahuwah whether, you know. Just Where like, is the verse that says, uh, is this the man who wreaked heaven or wreaked yeah. havoc in all the nations? Um, yeah, that's uh, Isaiah 14, I think. <clears throat> I do think there's a correlation with the anti-Messiah and Satan in Isaiah 14, because if you read it from start to finish, it's actually also referencing the king of Babylon. And so there's this, there's this like connection. And I do think that there's a connection in Isaiah 14 that it's not just talking about Satan, but it's also talking about the anti-Messiah. And as it says, but you said in your heart, I will go up to heaven. I will set my throne above the stars of, he of heaven. And I will sit on a lofty mountain on the lofty mountains towards the north. I will go up ab above the clouds. I will be like the most high, but now you shall go down to Sheol, even to the foundations of the earth. They that see you shall wonder at you, say, this is the man that troubled the earth, that made kings to shake. And the reason I believe it's not just talking about Satan is because in Revelation 9, we are given the identity of the beast, that he's Apollo. And it says mm -hmm. that this guy is the Malachim of the bottomless pit. And so in Isaiah 14... Possibly this could be saying that not just Satan, but the anti-Messiah was cast down into Sheol or the bottomless pit. And it would make sense connecting with Revelations 9 because Nimrod is Apollo. And it's saying that the, the name of, a, of the uh, Malachim of the bottomless pit is Apollyon 
or Apollo. And so if he was casted down to Sheol, that's who Yahuwah could be talking about too because another connection too between Satan and Nimrod is Nimrod in Genesis 11 with the Tower of Babel was trying to reach up into heaven. So there's definitely a connection with, I, I personally, that's my opinion, I believe that Isaiah 14 is actually talking about Satan, but also talking about basically the pawn that Satan's using to get accomplished what he wants to get accomplished. The, the pawn is Nimrod. And the, because um, the title of this chapter in some translations will actually say the king of Babylon. And so taking into consideration what the context is, it kind of makes sense that it could be both. It could be Satan being thrown into Sheol, and it could be um, the, also the anti-Messiah Nimrod at the same time. Um, and it says the, the title for the Septuagint, in my version of Isaiah 14, says the restoration of Jacob, which I think is pretty interesting. So this... We know that um, Nimrod, if, if he is a beast, and I think he is, will be thrown into the lake of fire with his false prophet, which I do believe is the Pope. Um, but it also says this is the uh, lake of fire prepared for the devil and his malachim. And I think that Satan, his judgment comes later um, because he has, he's put into chains for a thousand years. And after the thousand years are finished, he leads the nations astray one last time before his judgment. But oh, yeah. um, it talks about somewhere, it talks about is this the man who wreaked, wreaked havoc with the nations? And I think that that was talking about Satan perhaps being turned into a man right before his destruction because sure. uh, he's put before the nations and basically everybody has a look at him for wh how he truly is. Mm. That's what I got from, from mm. I got when it's referring to a man um, that it possibly could be switched switching his attention to Nimrod possibly because it says let's see it says in my version it actually breaks up the chapter into titles and stuff like that it says Yashrael's remnant taunts Babylon and, um, and it starts off with Yahuwah in that it shall come to pass in that day that Yahuwah shall give you rest from your sorrow and vexation and from your hard servitude wherein you did serve them and you shall take up this lamentation against the king of Babylon. <clears throat> and how has the extortioner ceased and the taskmaster ceased? And who has broken the yoke of transgressors, the yoke of princes, having smitten a nation in wrath with an incurable plague, smitting a nation with a wrathful plague, which spares them not? He rested in quiet. All the earth cries aloud with joy. The trees also of Lebanon rejoice against you. And the cedar of Lebanon saying, from the time that you have been laid low, no one has come up to cut us down. So Sheol from beneath is provoked to meet you. All the great ones that have ruled over the earth have risen up together against you. They that have raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations now if you think about that for a second, that kind of jumped out at me because the kings of the nations give their authority to the beast. So it's kind of interesting that this guy, this, you know, um, you know, that's being thrown down and says Sheol is going to swallow you up. And it's saying that the kings of the nations are rising up against you. So, I don't, I don't know. It could be either way. I think, personally, I think there's 
um, a part of the chapter where it's referring to Satan himself, and then it switches focus to the man, Nimrod, and because it talks about the king of Babylon, like specifically, and about the destruction of Babylon. And I don't know, to me, it would make a lot of sense if it's talking about Nimrod because it, it's, you know, um, it, because then it seems like it's switching gears like halfway through the chapter when it goes from 1412 talking about Halel and it says, how has Halel that rose in the morning fallen from heaven? He that sent orders to all the nations is crushed to the earth. But you said in the heart, I will go up to heaven. I will set my throne above the stars of heaven. I will sit on lofty mountain, on the lofty mounds towards the north. I will go up above the clouds. I will be like the most high. But now you shall go down to Sheol, or hell, even to the foundations of the earth. They that see you shall wonder at you and say, so this is the man that troubled the earth that made kings to shake. I mean, it's very possible Shushana could be right that he's turned into a man, but it could be possible also that there maybe there's two people you, who is talking to in this chapter. And it's, it's possible that Satan is the sovereign behind Nimrod and that because Nimrod pretty much, according to the book of Jasher, he wanted to be, he wanted to do the same thing Satan wanted to do. He wanted to kill Yahuwah and take his place according to the book of Jasher, and he wanted to, that was the whole point of the Tower of Babel, so in the same respect, yes, Satan wanted to go up into heaven, but also did Nimrod. He wanted to go up into heaven and take you who is thrown. So, I mean, what's, what's, what uh, Isaiah 14, 12, all the way down can apply to both of them, actually. And it could well, be. We end up in the same place. Yeah, and <laughs> I do believe, though, that they, at different times, they're thrown down into the pit. I believe Nimrod was thrown down first, like Shushana. I agree with Shushana. Nimrod's in the pit right now, and um, Satan doesn't get thrown down into the pit until later, because in, in the millennium, he's already in the At that point, he's in the pit. I think right now, Satan's Right now, he will be thrown into the lake of fire at the same time. That his false prophet is thrown in. Oh, actually, and no. That was, um, the, he's actually thrown in after. I can show you in Revelations 20. It says here that I'm going to do a share screen real quick. Revelations 20 actually says that the beast and the false prophet are thrown in. And then in the next chapter, it says Satan is thrown in after them. So I just yeah. want to show you that real quick because they're, they're, they are thrown in before him. Um, let me see. Okay, so let's see. Right here, this is where I get the precept here. It's Revelations 20, actually, verse 10. And, yeah. and let me see here. Let me go to share screen just real quick right here. And it says in Revelations 20, 10, And the devil who led them astray was thrown into the lake of fire and so forth where the beast and false prophet are. So they're already in, in the lake of fire. When right. he's, so that would mean they've been thrown in before he was thrown in. And they shall be tortured day and night forever and ever. So probably the chapter before that, I think it's Revelations 19 they're thrown in. And then Satan's thrown in. So let me see here. I want to find the verse where it talks about them being thrown in first. Um, bless her, those called to the verse. And the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet, who worked signs in his presence, by which he led astray those who received the mark of the beast, and those who worshipped the beast, or worshipped his image. The two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, burning with sulfur. Wow. And then 21 is even worse. It says, the rest were killed with the sword which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. So I guess that's the, uh, that's the feast that he talks about in prophecy. Bowels of the air, beasts yeah. of the earth. I will prepare you a great feast of the kings of the earth. So that's where Ezekiel gets that. 
Um, but wow, I mean, yeah, that's that's one thing I did realize recently, which is kind of interesting. Which I always joke around. That's the only Trinity in Scripture. <laughs> that's the only. <laughs> tri- yeah, you got the Beast, the Anti Messiah, the False Prophet, who is pretty much like a, a anti John the Baptist, and then you have Satan himself. So. Those three are completely separate. They're completely three entities that are different. And that's really what the Trinity doctrine is, is that three gods are somehow one God. That's pretty much what the Catholic Church has taught people, that the Trinitarian doctrine, I think it's called, that you that somehow God the Father is one God, God, God the Son is one God, and then the Holy Spirit is a God itself. And that three are God. It's it just doesn't even make sense. It really doesn't. And it's but anyway, that's that's pretty much why I came to the conclusion that I did with the beast and the false prophet being in there already. And it's kind of interesting because it talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb is right before the beast and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire. So me and the marriage supper of the Lamb happens before uh, before the new heaven and new earth. It's pretty interesting. There's like certain stuff I never knew about, like chronologically. Like I was always lost in chronological um, end time study. Yeah, think, well, that's why we have to um, be married to Messiah before we can destroy the wicked and we under him destroy the wicked before the kingdom can begin. <clears throat> anyway, are we ready to read chapter 21? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Thank you for getting us back on track. Thank you. <laughs> All right, um whoever wants to uh read, if not, I have no problem with reading again. I'll try. I'll give it a go. Okay. All right. So. And I proceeded to where matters were dis- disordered, and I saw there was some horrible matter. I saw neither a heaven above nor a firmly founded earth, but a place disorderly and horrible. And I saw seven stars of the Shemahim bound together in it, like great mountains and burning with fire. And then I said, for what sin are they bound? And on what account have they been cast in here? Then spoke Ariel, one of the Kodesh messengers who was with me and was chief over them and said, Enoch, why do you ask? And why are you eager for the truth? These are the number of the stars of the heavens which have transgressed the command of Yahuwah and are bound here till 10,000 years, the time entailed by their sins are ended. From there, I went to another place, which was still more horrible than the former. And I saw horrible matter, a great fire there, which burnt and blazed, and the place was divided as far as the abyss, being full of great descending columns of fire. Neither in extent or magnitude could I see, nor could I guess. And then I said, how fearful is the place and how horrible to look upon. Then Ariel answered me, one of the Kodesh messengers who was with me, and said unto me, Enoch, why have you such fear and terror? And then I answered, because of this fearful place and because of the spectacle of the pain. And then he said to me, this place is the prison of the messengers, and here they will be imprisoned forever. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I love too is another correlation I see is the Malachim are always called stars in the Book of Enoch, and Revelation does the same thing because the seven angels are not, my bad, not angels, seven Malachim of the, the seven assemblies are, are the seven stars. So the Revelation actually defines 
Malachim are heavenly bodies, heavenly messengers as as stars. So it's kind of cool that Enoch has like that same thing. It seems like they're calling them stars, and you know, he keeps saying that they transgressed against their commandment. Maybe they transgressed against their alignment. They're like wandering, kind of like what Jude says. <coughs> Because Jude actually... They transgressed the deceived mankind. That's what I'm seeing. Their transgression deceived mankind. And, um, you know, this, uh, this place that Enoch sees is um, something that should inspire mankind to fear Yahuwah, because if he spared not the angels that sinned, he's not going to spare humans that persist in sinning. And there's a scripture that says that. Yeah, that's actually Peter. Again, Peter. <laughs> Peter talks about that stuff a lot. And that's yeah. why I'm so surprised people have rejected Enoch. Because the disciples... They obviously read from Enoch. The um, Jude, which his name should be Yahuda, which is rumored to be one of Yahusha's half-brothers. And he he says, you know, in his one and only chapter of his book, he talks about wandering stars that are reserved for the blackness of judgment. He's, you know, they obviously read Enoch, and they obviously, so it, it just blows my mind Christians are like, Oh, that's Gnosticism, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, how is it Gnosticism? Like, which Enoch are you referring to? Because there, there's a bad Enoch. There's the Enoch son of Cain. Maybe that's the one that has Gnosticism in his writings. You know, but it, it's amazing that we've missed this for so many years. The, the disciples themselves quoted from this book. Well, forgive me in my ignorance here, but I thought that, okay. So when it says list the days of Noah and whatnot shall be in the day of the end, so I'm thinking that the <coughs> giants are going to come back. Okay, but it says here clearly that this place is the prisoner of the messengers, the giants, and they will be in prison forever. So then I went back to mm -hmm. Hold on. So then I went back to, I think it's uh, six. Yeah, the uh, chapter, I think one of the chapters we just read says 10,000 years. And no, it says that, um, hold on. <laughs> I think I know what you're pondering. Why? It's the, 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 the evil spirit. Hold on. Is it in the. Yeah, the it is the evil spirits that will torment because they have resented us. Yeah, the evil or unclean spirits are the ones that Right. That's why I had to reread and I read it, but then I lost my place to make my point. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, I thought you were you were wondering about the terminology with forever, and then before that it says ten thousand years. I was even wondering that. I'm like, that's a little weird, but actually, the Hebrew word that we translate there's two Hebrew words. That unfortunately, we've translated both for forever, and one of them actually means for a long period of time, and not meaning eternity. So that's where. It gets confusing, especially in the canon. You'll see somewhere in Old Testament it says forever, but then when someone's quoting from the New Testament, it, they're not saying forever. So that I thought you were worried about that. Because it in, it's in 15 verse. Um, yeah. 15. 15, 15. And now the giants who are produced from spirits and flesh shall be called evil spirits upon the earth and the earth shall be their dwelling evil spirits have proceeded from their bodies because they are born from men and from uh -huh. 
watchers in the beginning in the tribal origin. They shall be evil spirits on the earth, and the evil spirits shall they be called. And the spirits of heaven and the Shemayim shall be their dwelling, but as far as the spirits of the earth, which are upon the earth, and on the earth shall be their dwelling. And the spirits of the giants afflict, oppress, destroy, attack, do battle, and work destruction on the earth, and cause trouble. They take no food, but nothing less, hunger and thirst, and cause offenses. And these spirits shall rise up against the children of men and against the women, because they have proceeded from them. Mm. Yeah, they're, they're pretty much, their goal is to torture us, and pretty much attack us, and pretty much, you know, they just, <coughs> their, their whole goal is to pretty much torment mankind because they envy us and they're pretty much just jealous because they're roaming spirits they don't have bodies right um, that's what i was getting at right and yahuwah actually gave them a curse too that they will have an unquestionable hunger and thirst but won't be able to fill it since they don't have a body so right. they're they're pretty much tortured their whole existence and they're immortal they can't die so they're tortured for their whole lives, and they're taking it out on us. And pretty much they envy us because we do have an expected end, and so on and so forth. And we can fulfill our need for food, our need to drink water, or you know, so on and so forth. So I think it's more out of envy they're tormenting us. And they're pretty much doing it, too, because they're, they're under um, the power of Satan. <clears throat> because he's called the prince of demon in the New Testament. I can actually find that verse for you guys, but he's called Beelzebub, Lord of the Flies, Prince of Demons. So he's the principality that they're under. He's the one that pretty much can control them, and you know, and that's where that's where Solomon started messing up. He started trying to you know, trying to control demons for some reason. I don't know why he did it. I mean, it, I can't even understand a benefit to that, but he was like, King Solomon, when he started going astray, he would like try to summon demons and control them with that seal of Solomon, that star of Molech. It was just weird. Like, why even try that stuff? Like, it doesn't even make sense. And <laughs> There's actually a stupid book about it too, which is really weird like a book called the key of Solomon. I'm like, the heck? Like, <clears throat> so, but yeah, they're, they're pretty much, they don't have an end and they're pretty much going to be, you know, tortured forever. The, the, the Nephilim spirits. Well, that answers a lot. Cause I thought it was them coming, you know, being put away and then coming back, but it's no, they're, they're still there, but it, they're called an effect of the evil spirit. Mm -hmm. Right. I get it now. Yeah, they're, they're these evil spirits that need a body, and that's why they try to go into us, because they need a body um, you know, to do things. Other than that, they're pretty much just spirits that roam around, that roam from Sheol to our Earth. And it's kind of interesting that they can only be in, like, our realm or in the ground they can't go to heaven they're they're like they're restricted from being in the heavens Hello. it says the spirit of the heavens dwell there and then it says the spirits of them i think it says dwell in the prison let me see if i can find that i gotta get going Okay, well, we've had you. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Laurel. Yeah? Yeah. If I can remember what I said. Shalom, everyone. Um, we just took a quick intermission. I also wanted to mention and share my screen here. Um, a cool find I actually found in the Septuagint 
where it usually reads Garden of Eden, it actually says in the Septuagint of Ezekiel 28, 13, it says, you were in the delight of the paradise of Elohim. So they actually put paradise for Eden and for Garden. So for Garden of Eden, they put the delight of paradise. Very interesting stuff. And wow. So praise Yahuwah for the Septuagint. A little connection there with Yahuwah's kingdom in Eden. So um, I just wanted to say that. And um, let's see. I guess I haven't read in a little bit. So I guess I could read chapter 22. And let's see. The title for it is Sheol or the Underworld. So this is pretty much the place where most um, false man-made religions take Sheol and make it their own, you know, place of the dead, underworld. And just the Greeks have done it, the Egyptians have done it, and so on and so forth. So here we go. Um, chapter 22. And there I went to another place, and he showed me in the west another great and high mountain and of hard rock. And there were four hollow places in it, deep and very smooth. Three of them were dark and one bright. <clears throat> and there was a fount of water in its mist. And I said, how smooth are these hollow places and deep and dark to view. And Raphael answered one of the set apart Malachim who was with me and said unto me, these hollow places have been created for this very purpose, that the spirits of the souls of the dead should assemble therein. Yea, that all the souls of the children of men should assemble. And these places have been made to receive them till the day of their judgment, until their appointed period, till the period appointed, till the great judgment comes upon them. I saw the spirits of the children of men who were dead, and their voice went forth to heaven and made suit. Then I asked Raphael, the Malachim who was with me, and I said unto him, the spirit, this spirit, whose is it? Whose voice goes up forth and makes suit. He answered me saying, this is the spirit which went forth from Abel, whom his brother Cain slew. And he makes his suit against him till his seed is destroyed from the face of the earth. And his seed is annihilated from amongst the seed of men. <coughs> Then I asked regarding it, regarding all the hollow places, why is one separated from the other? And he answered me and said unto me, these three have been made that the spirits of the dead might be separated. And such a division has been made for the spirits of the righteous, in which there as the bright spring of water. And this has been made for transgressors when they die and are buried from the earth. And judgment has not been executed on them in their lifetime. Here their spirits shall be set apart in this great pain till the great day of judgment and punishment, torment of those who curse forever and retribution for their spirits. There he shall bind them forever. And such a division has been made for the spirits of those who make their suit who make disclosures concerning their destruction when they were slain in the days of the transgressions. Such has been made for the spirits of men who were not righteous but transgressors, who were complete in transgression, and of the transgressors they shall be companions. But their spirits shall not be slain in the day of judgment, nor shall they be raised from them. Then I blessed Yahuwah the steam and said, Blessed be my master and Yahuwah of righteousness, who rules forever. So, wow. Seems like there's a vision. And, um, yeah, it's pretty much Sheol. It kind of reminded me of uh, the division of Abraham's bosom and, uh, you know, the other part of Sheol, what Yahusha talks about in the book of Luke. I don't know, that's kind of. Quarterly. You know, the thing that it says in scripture that the blood of righteous Abel cried out.
from the ground where his brother Cain spilled it. And um, right here it says, it, it's like a second witness. This is the spirit which went forth from Abel, whom his brother Cain slew, and he makes his suit against him until his seed is destroyed from the face of the earth, and his seed is annihilated from amongst the seed of men. So Cain has nothing to look forward to but the lake of fire in the end because he didn't repent is what this is telling me. And this is another reason I say we need to fear Yahuwah because if we don't fear Yahuwah the way we should fear Yahuwah, and I mean fear to disobey Yahuwah because this is what happens. Uh, men will think, oh, well, I'll always have another chance. No, no, you won't. You'll have one chance. And that's this lifetime in, in which to get things right. If you, if you know the truth, you're going to end up in the lake of fire and be gone forever, annihilated from amongst the seed of men, just like Cain. So you have to get it right. And um, I don't see people fearing Yahuwah the way they should fear him. And we have um, many, many resources such as staying in the scriptures, prayer, fellowship, and um, these are the things that keep us from sinning and keep us in the knowledge of the truth and keep us from ending up like Cain. What I wanted to say. Wow. More and more, it seems like that Enoch is really a good book to understand the afterlife, too, to kind of understand where we go when we die. And that's what I kind of like. This, this concept of Sheol is not really explored in, in our canon that we have. And we see Sheol in the Tanakh, but it's not really explored upon. You know, we know it's the grave, but I like how Enoch goes deep into it. Like, this is where the sons of men go when they die. And it's kind of like, you know, this is, this is why I've told people, don't, don't ask me to speak at someone's funeral. Please don't. Because... I'm not going to lie for you. Like, everyone is waiting the resurrection. No one's in heaven. And, you know, so I really like that Enoch goes deep into elements of Sheol. Um, you know, the um, I think there was a verse that talked about the tree of life in the, in the beginning of Enoch, like in the first couple of chapters. And, I don't know. I just really like the celestial type of stuff that's in this book that you really don't get in the Bible. It kind of glosses over it, but I just like I like a lot of the stuff. Like I like the description of he of uh, the firmament in this book. You know, it's it's you know called a vault many times, and so it's very interesting. So the next chapter is very short. We can definitely do another one. Um, this is four verses. And the title is The Fire That Deals With the Luminaries of Heaven. Yeah, sure. 
From thence I went to another place, to the west of the ends of the earth, and I saw a burning fire, which ran without resting, and paused not from its course, day or night, but ran regularly. And I asked, saying, What is this which rests not? Then Raguel, one of the Kadesh angels, who was with me, answered me and said unto me, This course of fire which you have seen is the fire in the west, which persecutes all the luminaries of heaven. Interesting. Yes. Hmm. These are evidently the the ones that send the wandering stars and uh, the others. Hmm. I wonder if this is talking about the ones that send because it says this is all the luminaries. Would that wouldn't that be like pretty much everyone that's in in the heavens? Wouldn't that be pretty much like all the hosts of heaven? Well, they're not going to be persecuted unless they sin. Yeah, that's true. It's just weird, the terminology, the all the luminaries. So that's kind of weird. Unless it's, unless it's just generally saying that all of them that sinned, which I guess would make a lot more sense if that they would have worded it that way. Or because it's, it's weird. Well, I don't know that all of them sinned. I just think oh, no, no, a third no. of them. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that uh, the way they word it is like they're including every host of heaven in this, and that's where it gets confusing. I'm not saying that I believe mm -hmm. that all of them sinned either. I'm just saying the way they word it is very weird. Because we know luminaries and hosts of heaven refer to the Malachim and... <clears throat> You know, all the luminaries, it kind of sounds like it's putting them all in one. That's that's where I, I just think if they would have worked, whoever translated this would have worded it a little differently. It, it's kind of confusing. And um, uh, the, the other thing I was thinking of too was, you know, Yahuwah, it could be Yahuwah's fire that's persecuting them because he's a consuming fire. And a lot of times in scripture, you know, he's he's uh, portrayed as a flaming fire. Um, you know, his appearance, even like his eyes were a flame of fire, Yahusha. So, and um, I believe when he he destroys the anti messiah and the false prophet, that he's gonna literally consume him. With, uh, I think it says with the brightness of his coming, he talks about his mouth. You know, shooting out fire. You know, so there, it's definitely something correlating with Yahuwah punishing them with fire. That I know for a fact. Is. And the breath of his lips. Um, it says when he comes, he consumes them with the breath of his lips. Wow. Um. Mm. I think we got time for these. One more short, short chapter here. 24 is only like six verses. <clears throat> and I think I'll read that one and then we can um, end the recording. But first, I would like to do an outro prayer, definitely, before we end the recording. Just keep everyone in our prayers. Yes. And, um, so, interestingly enough, my title says, I don't know if yours has titles or anything, but mine says, for chapter 24. I don't have titles. Huh. That's interesting. Mine does not have titles. Maybe Skiba added these titles of mine. I don't know. It says the seven mountains in the northwest in the tree of life. That's an interesting title. From there, I went to another place of the earth, and he showed me a mountain, range of fire, which burns day and night. Kind of like a volcano, I guess. And I went beyond it and saw seven 
magnificent mountains, all differing each from the other. And the stones thereof were magnificent and beautiful, magnificent as a whole of esteemed appearance and fair exterior, three towards the east and one founded in the other, and three towards the south, one upon the other. And deep row ravens, <laughs> or deep rough ravens, no one of which joined with any other. And the seventh mountain was in the middle of these, and it excelled them in height. Interesting, another symbology was seven. Hmm. Resembling the seat of a throne. Wow, that brings a whole new light to Ezekiel 28. That brings <laughs> a whole new light to Isaiah 14. He wanted to sit on the lofty mountain. Huh. Resembling the seat of a throne. And fragrant trees encircled the throne. And amongst them was a tree such as I had never yet smelt, neither was any amongst them, nor were others like it. It had a fragrance beyond all fragrance, and its leaves and blot blooms and wood wither not forever, and its fruit is beautiful, and its fruit resembles the dates of a palm. Then I said, how beautiful is this tree and fragrant and its leaves are fair and it blooms very delightful in appearance. And then answered, Mikael, one of the set apart and honored Malikim who was with me and was their leader. Ah, uh, cliffhanger. <laughs> All right, guys, you're going to have to tune in <laughs> to next time. But before that, um, any comments, Shoshana, before we end the recording? Anything that uh, just that um, what you read in, I guess, is verse two. Um, deep, rough, you said ravens, it's ravines. It's not ravens. Ravens are birds. Ravines are. Ah. Land. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. No, well, it's uh, an interesting um, portrayal of this, the place that he's talking about. Um, we know that Yahuwah has prepared for those who love him things that we can't even imagine. Our heart hasn't even imagined all the things he has prepared for us who love him. So if anyone's listening to this that hasn't made up their mind, I would suggest that you do it now and love him. And to love him means to keep his commandments. For this is the love of Yahweh, that we keep his commandments. And um, that's what I want to say. Hallelujah. And just to add to that note, he loved the world so much, John 3, 16, he gave his only son that whoever believes in him and the word believe is trust, to have faith, to be trusting to him and to actually have enough faith to follow him wherever he leads you. And mm -hmm. whoever does trust and believe in him and have faith in him that we would be saved, we believe in him. So, yes. you know, who has sent his son not to condemn the world, but to try to save the world? Right. Well, that's and our. We know we stumble. We 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 don't keep the law perfectly, although we try. But that's not how we're saved in keeping the law. We do the best we can to keep the law but when we stumble we have a savior that we can go to and we can confess our sins and ask for forgiveness in his name and the father is faithful to forgive us so it's not just about how well we can keep the law it's not that at all 
he has unmerited pardon for those who try to keep the law and do their best. And we all fall. Nobody's perfect. We all fall. And I, I want to encourage anyone who thinks they've fallen too far because they haven't, as long as they can consider repenting, they haven't fallen too far. Hallelujah. Yeah. And we encourage we encourage people to to seek his word out and to accept the gospel and just a very quick rundown of what the true good news is and what we believe the true good news is, John 3.16. But also, more importantly, the purpose of John 3.16 was for Yahuwah to destroy the works of the wicked one and to bring salvation to the whole world through his nation, Yashra'al. And that's, that's the whole good news for us to be part of his bride. And for all of yeah. us to be joined back to him for him, for him to find a way in his own law that said he could not do it he found a loophole to take us back back to be his spiritual bride and that is the mystery paul talks about and that is why you should accept him because he is giving you a free way you don't have to pay for it you can't earn it it's not a reward it's a gift ephesians 2 8 to 9 his free gift is for you to accept your reservation in the book of life. And so I hope you guys really think about that and accept him, that he died for you and he loved enough to be resurrected so that we would have life. He tore the veil for each and every one of us. So I just, I pray you guys would accept his free gift of salvation and those that are coming out of the Christian church, welcome. We, uh, you can find our Awakened by Yahuwah group on Facebook. Message me, Doug, um, my sister, Shushana, um, um, and Bobby, our brothers, Bobby and Krista Musap, you will be able to find on Facebook as well. Um, we fellowship 1 p.m. every Shabbat, and we fellowship on the, basically the end of the preparation day on Friday nights at 8 p.m. usually. So. Um, if you guys want to fellowship with us, and if you guys want to join our group, please contact us. Um, so until next time, this is Brother Doug and Sister Shushana. Have a great night and a wonderful, wonderful week. Bye.